There we go. Success. All right, we are live. And I'm just going to pull this up. I'm so excited to have you all. And I would love for you, I'm going to go ahead and now that, now that we're live, I'll unpin you, even though I think, <laughs> I think I'd be happy to have you stay pen the whole time. All right, here we go. Uh, that's perfect. So thank you both for, for joining us today. And um, we've had several conversations and I've had the privilege of spending almost a full day with you all on brain health and in particular you all focus on the marginalized communities in terms of prevention of Alzheimer's and other dementias. And of course, that's something that's very close to my heart. So I love the work that you do and especially the work that you're doing through yoga. And I think it's really um, not only unique, but it's, it's something where just after spending so much time with you all, where your own personalities really shine through. And I think that's pretty special. So I'd love for you to take a moment and introduce yourselves and introduce the, go ahead and introduce our topic today. Okay, I'm gonna start. I wanted to introduce myself in um, a way that I've been taught by people in my community, my sister, some of my uh, spiritual sheroes is that my name is Naya. I'm the daughter of Dolores, who's the daughter of Daisy, who's the daughter of Anna, who's the daughter of Martha. And those, and there are more people who, are the, who they are the daughters of, but I don't know their names because they were stolen, enslaved, murdered, Maya, and renamed. Daughter. And that's why these names like Martha is not very much an African name. The daughter of Martha. But and those, ooh, I'm getting an echo in my ear. Are you getting okay. that too? I think, the echo, I think the echo's fixed now. Okay, great. And so we wanted to, Z and I, one of the practices that we do is acknowledgement of silence for all our ancestors, people of African descent who were stolen, enslaved, murdered, and renamed. So we're hoping that everyone in solidarity could perhaps close their eyes or keep them open with a soft gaze and connect to those people, Z and my people who were stolen, enslaved, murdered and renamed. So let's just take a moment for these people, for Z and my ancestors, and many other people who are listening, their ancestors, and watch the breath. And then gently you can blink the eyes open if they were closed, knowing it was so little time for so many people. Z, you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, hey, I'm Z Cruz. Uh, I'm happy to be here with you guys and um, and just share, share, educate, and 
maybe learn something new. You never know. That was an incredibly powerful way to begin. Um, and I love the idea of recognizing our ancestors, being the daughter of, the granddaughter of, the aunt, the sister, and, and really recognizing where we came from and our relationships. And I think what's even more powerful about that is it doesn't matter if those relationships were um, in some cases, right? We don't have a relationship with our mom or don't have, didn't have a relationship with our grandmother, but yet we can still recognize that we are who we are because of our ancestry. And I think that's a really, a really powerful thing. And I, I know you wanted to chat a bit about um, ancestral healing. And I, I would love to know really more about that and specifically um, the spiritual movement through ancestral healing, what it is or what it means to you and how you incorporate that in your, in your practices. Well, <laughs> everything we do is with our ancestors. They, they are us and we are them. And regardless of whether or not we want to acknowledge it, we do and feel all the things that they go through. So in doing ancestral healing, we're healing ourselves and in healing ourselves, we're healing the ancestors and everything that they've gone through. And it's really important for us, for Nai and I, because our community has been disparaged for so long, right? And, and, um, and our stories aren't our stories. They're his stories, right? Or her stories. So it's important for us to take that back, to claim what's ours to claim what's our ancestors, to take our lineage and do what we need to do. And in that, we heal ourselves and we heal them. Yeah. A while back, I, um, I started thinking about the chakras as a African-American woman and all the trauma that's in the black body and my black body, chakrally explained. Like I thought about the root chakra that we've lost our home, right? It's that safety, stability, and security. So we're taken from Africa, but even today when I walk or drive, I somehow get pulled over by the police all the time. So I can't feel safe, stable, or secure. So like root chakra issues, loss of homeland, not being able to feel um, comfortable in my own neighborhood in my own city like i've only felt comfortable twice in my life walking around calcutta and in cuba where everybody was brown and i didn't even understand until i got to cuba how much armoring there is in the body in the black body and my black body because of this hyper vigilance that we have we experience being people of color where there's always this assumption that i'm stealing or i don't belong so that's also how yoga comes in because yoga can address that armoring. So that was like the, the root chakra. It's like, wow, we have root chakra issues. Yeah, and for sure, Naya. Like in, in, in saying like our home, like we are, we ha don't have security in our skin and that's our first home. And it's, it's not that, um, it's not that we can, uh, take it away, but just being in the skin yeah. is a threat. So our skin is a threat to anyone who does not have it, yeah. unfortunately for us. And it puts us in that survival, as Naya said, always having to put that armor, always having to think twice before taking a step because it can cost us our life. Yeah, and we've seen, and still does, yeah. you know.
And, and then I moved up to the sacral chakra and I was thinking about all the rapes and I myself have, was raped when I was 15. But then all the, the, the rapes in the history of African, people of African descent in this country. And then the forced sexuality, the forced breeding. And then the, the idea, the, the ideas and images of us as black people being so hypersexual like these fetishes of like having big sexual organs or, or being like wild. When I was in college, people were always like, oh, I heard she's wild in bed, you know, because she's a black woman. So this idea of this, um, this these, all these ideas about our sexuality mm -hmm. and also the sacral chakra is creativity but I heard, wow, we have sacral chakra issues because of these, this, this um, multi-generational trauma and then all these horrible stereotypes that I don't get to be me. I, get to, I have to be this hypersexualized black woman. And it's, um, so that's another issue that we can work on in, a, in, a, in this ancestral um, movement class. And I don't say yoga right now because like the yoga therapists are now saying yoga is only things that are Vedic or from India. And so now I'm starting to wonder if I can use yoga as a word anymore now that the, I'm a yoga therapist, now the guidelines have come down. Mm -hmm. So that's why I'm calling it spiritual movement because I'm not just drawing from India and I love India and I've studied in India, but I mean, I'm taking things from African, from Zulu traditions, from my grandfather is Greek, from what I know from that. I have Jewish blood. So, but, so this idea now that yoga is defining itself as, as just Vedic or India, just Indian, at least the yoga therapists are, is making me want to move away from that word for right now. Yeah, and the claim. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I wasn't aware that there was new, a new statement on that. I would be curious to, to read that. Yeah, I'll huh. send that to you. Yeah, interesting. Yeah. So, so I really, to circle back to, and maybe you're gonna do that at the end. Um, how, how is, what does that ancestral healing look like? Moving through the chakras, just understanding within your own body or yeah. what other, what other ways it's it's through that is through moving through certain postures and meditations and acknowledgement and and not being afraid which is why it's so important who is helping to keep the safe space because there are certain things that are not shared in certain spaces because certain things cannot be understood you can try to intellectualize it but if it ha hasn't happened to you you cannot com completely understand. Yeah, and I'm using, when I'm teaching, um, I'm using some movement, some what we call restorative poses, you know, long holds, mm -hmm. some also some movements, and maybe in the yogic language in a trauma-informed way, because I do believe that as people of color, as highly melanated people, we all have experienced um, race-based traumatic stress. So the, this class, this spiritual movement, ancestor healing class is, is drawing from some of the principles of trauma, but we're also dealing with cultural ways we speak culturally, you know, as, as black people, we have our, our, our cultural ways of, and not just one, but there are many ways like we, we, we want to talk to each other. Like it's not a class where you just come in and you're just silent. I can never teach a yoga class like that. And when I'm in them all the time, I just, I always feel like so shut down. Like we can't speak in the beginning. We can't speak in the end. We can't speak during. And when I teach, I want to say like, how is that feeling? What are, and then using some meditation techniques and some affirmation and some visualizations. So it's a mixture of a number of things. And then looking into whoever's tradition is there, like, there can be things like Z is Caribbean. There are things that people do for healing that's a traditional to her. I'm, I'm from Philadelphia, from you know the people from the South Carolina that came to Philadelphia, but my family were really, they were Gullah people. And there are things that are indigenous to us so that that can be incorporated 
into a yoga class. Like, I don't think we just have to say only Sanskrit and do things that are in the Pradipika, you know, that we can actually, and if we want to just, there's a great music on or drumming. And if you want to move in an intuitive way, that can be very healing. Like everything doesn't have to be so this shape at this moment, because these shapes don't all work for everybody. Like sometimes when I'm teaching, I'm like, I have boobs. So if you're going down in that restorative child's pose or whatever, and it's crushing my boobs, you know? And maybe for a 14 year old Indian boy, like being taught by Krishnamacharya, it's like no problem. But for me, like it hurts because my boobs are getting smashed. <laughs> totally. <laughs> I love it. Uh, well, I, you know, I think, I think that speaks to a lot of, a lot of women right now. <laughs> it certainly, it certainly does to me. Um, I appreciate that. But, so going back to the, the thread of um, the race-based traumatic stress and, and, and how that fits in with your teaching. I know you guys offer um, specific black center classes and you offer classes for, 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 you know, you're, I think you're calling it some different things. I know you had just recently changed. The, yeah. For all. <laughs> yes. But for everyone. Um, and I really, and, and, and being really transparent, it's fairly new for me to think about that because I think you know, like, like I'm not speaking for all white yoga women, but a lot of this has really took the, taken the veil down and there's so much learning that has happened like a, like a drinking it from a fire hose in the last five, six months. And, you know, just acknowledging white body privilege and, and so just so much of it. And I think because if you'd asked me six months ago to said, I want things to be inclusive. I want, you know, I want everyone to feel comfortable in my classes. I would never dream of having a class of just white women or just black women. Like I, and, and now I understand, at least I think I do, but I'd love to hear more about why you feel it's important and, and, and how you go about it. Well, well I've, you go to <laughs> Yeah. Um, I believe it's important to acknowledge the fact that most classes before were just white people. Like this, this is something that we just need to acknowledge. It, it may not be because it was said that it needed to be specifically white people, but it's just the way it was. And even me, I'm, I teach yoga. I've been practicing yoga for many years. I have my master's degree in yoga studies. I'm most of the time, I'm the only black person in a class, in a studio. If I see another highly melanated person, black person, it's, I get a nod. It's not, it's, there's an acknowledgement and, and it's, and for us, we have to really understand, I mean, as a society, we have to feel comfortable enough to step into that white space. So we have to feel comfortable enough in our skin to say, I'm gonna step in that room where I'm the only chocolate sprinkle, right? And, and not just because of skin color, but financial mm -hmm. reasons. Uh, yoga is not inexpensive. Most studios cost 25 a class, if you're lucky. Right? You guys are in LA. <laughs> I think it's a little more expensive there. <laughs> well, even though, I mean, I'm, I mean, I'm from New York and, and I live in LA, but I mean, really, even if it's $15, I that's know. $15 that you feed your family, eat. So the space is important. 
because we couldn't have it before. It's important because we were denied even if we wanted to do it, not just in doing yoga, just denied period in, in, in congregating, right? Unless it was in a church that taught what other people wanted us to learn, right? So we were not allowed to congregate. And, and the space is important for us as a community because then we can share our truths without it being told in another way. It's not miscommunicated. It's not gonna be appropriated. It's not gonna be stolen. It's not gonna be anything but what it is. Yeah, and we call that like a clash of realities. You know, what I think as a, a black woman might be very different from what somebody thinks as a white woman, but then I might start to think, oh, I must be crazy. Why am I seeing that? I must be uppity. I must be looking for things. So sometimes when I can be in a space with a, another Black woman and they say, it even happened to me the other day and we were in a meeting together and afterwards she called me and she said, did you hear that? And I said, yeah, I did, but I just assumed I was overreacting. And she said, overreacting, that was terrible. And I'm always like trying to, you know, thinking it's me, it's my problem. It's something that I, um, I made up. So when you can be in a, a group with uh, a, a, an affinity group, let's say, uh, self, my group that I was just been teaching since 2013 is for self-identified people of color. And so it's an affinity group where I can learn that I'm not crazy because other people feel it too. Because when you think it's just you and you're uppity or you're making things up or you're imagining it or you're hypersensitive, then you've got to store it somewhere and it gets stored in the body. Even after practicing yoga for 25 years, I'm so tight. Like I'm the tightest yoga teacher you would ever meet. And I'm sure it's because of all the trauma because I remember when I was in India studying just in this world of brown people, just after a week, I could do poses that I hadn't been able to do in, you know, at that time in 18 years, because I'm just holding so much in my body, even though I'm practicing all the time. There's just, I have a friend who's a massage therapist, who's an African-American man. He says he works on black people, works on white people, and the tightest people he works on are black people. I mean, it's all anecdotal but it's because we're holding so much stress. We always have to be so perfect and so, you know, not make waves and not be seen and not draw attention and can't do anything wrong and be ready for disappointment because maybe when we went into that job interview, they didn't, we, we knew they didn't think we would be who they saw. Mm -hmm. And so it's this so much holding so the yoga room or the spiritual movement says, okay, just for an hour, for half an hour, 15 minutes, 90 minutes, you can let go and you can get out of fight and flight into tend and mend and to rest and digest. And I think it ties into the larger issue, I think, and I think Z also believes of why we're at risk as African-Americans double at risk for Alzheimer's and dementia, so much more at risk for heart disease, diabetes. And I think it's the, the constant living and fight, flight and freeze. And yeah. not many people are talking about it. And that's why yoga or spiritual movement has meditation too, has so much potential for it. We actually need it more than everybody else mm -hmm. because we're, we're holding onto so much race-based trauma and Z was saying the other day maybe you should talk about it how it's just not one incident you know when you have some PTSD can just be one incident we're talking about a whole life it's every moment it's we we need to be protected in our home we need to be protected when we step out of our home we need to we're in fear when our children go out when our husbands boyfriends Anyone who is highly melanated, who looks like us, we have to constantly be in that traumatic space because we have no choice. We have to always send out that energy, whereas someone may have been 
molested, that's horrible, one time, maybe two times, maybe robbed, maybe beat, maybe brutalized, that's a few times. If you're really unlucky, maybe two handfuls. But if I tell you every second of my life, there's at least one thing that I have to worry about. That's, that's our life. And we can act like it's not what it is, but denying it and ignoring it is not going to change it. So the only option is to face it and to deal with it. And it's not saying that we can fix it because the unfortunate part is it's not just up to us. We're in a community that has designated the highly melanated human as a threat. So it's not really about us. So it, our movement is about living in a space knowing that you are a threat. And how can you be the best person that you can possibly be and live your best life in that space? Yeah. And do some practices that have, you know, have evidence that can help keep you from getting sick or help you do something with this trauma for a moment. You know, when I was first started, I think, I don't know if I said it last time, when I first started teaching uh, people of color yoga, I had so much hate mail and emails and everything. And, and it was the same time that that group in the, um, I think it was Seattle, they were, they were somewhere in the Washington state, they had to shut down because they had bomb threats and the radio announcer had said all these things. And I was just saying that I just wanted to have one class once a month, twice a month, that was for people of color. And people were calling me a racist and all these things. That and I just why, what is such the threat that we want to work on our own healing in community? And there were women's groups, there are men's groups, there are LGBTQ groups at the time, and all, all those things were considered valid, but a, a, a group for self-identified people of color was, was radical, was, was racist. And now I've even gone farther because with Alzheimer's, we do Black-centered. It's not even just self-identified people of color because the issue is a African-American issue, the numbers. So we said we have to even go even even farther, you know, but just because it's not even just people of color, it's a specific African American issue. And so now we can do it. It's a little safer. People are okay with it. Doesn't mean that I think like I don't trust it. I don't know if a year from now, mm -hmm. if it will not be safe again. Right now, I mean, I've there have, things have gone up and down. I've seen. I've been alive fifty years. I've seen. There are other moments, you know. There was Trayvon Martin, right? There was uh, there were other moments when people were alarmed, angry, and yet nothing changed. You know, so I'm hoping that this moment is a moment of change, but I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Yeah, we can always hope. Um, I don't know. I guess from from my very limited perspective, I feel like this is different. And from my my end and my community, I know, you know, even in Santa Fe, New Mexico, where there's just very, very few people of color and in terms of, of, of black African American community, um, it's mainly Hispanic and uh, Native American. Um, but even even that, you know, our, our whole studio sat down and said, what do we need to do? So I, don't know, I, I loved your suggestion. In fact, I sent it along. <laughs> Maybe I'll resend it to the studio again. <laughs> but, you know, in response, we now have $5 drop-in classes where we were the highest yoga, high, most expensive yoga studio in Santa Fe. Not my studio, but the studio that I teach at here. And so, I mean, I think you know, in terms of accessibility or in terms of awareness, it feels different. At least I hope so. I hope you're right. Yeah, I feel like 
the reality of it is, is if everyone does what they are supposed to do, it will change. Yeah. And as I said, you're doing what you need to do. And if other people do what they need to do, then it will definitely change. You know, yeah. all we need to do. You know, and a definition of yoga is like Michelle Williams is a skill in action. Mm. So we have to, I keep telling me, we have to do something. We have to be active. We can't just, I mean, I guess we could do whatever we want, but I advocate that we can't just meditate for world peace <laughs> and, and, and social justice. Yeah. And yes, we can do that as a part of things, but we also have to just get up and get going and you know like you said make a don't make a five dollar class make a donation class make sure there are people of color teaching you know because i only go to places i only practice at yoga studios that have black indigenous latinx teachers i don't practice um and places without those people not meaning that i have to be teaching those classes like i practice i practice at a studio that I don't teach at. Like I auditioned, they didn't, they didn't accept me. And I still, I still, uh, you know, I practice there. And they have an enormous amount of uh, black, Latinx, Asian teachers. And that's why I really respect that studio. And that's where I put my money into that studio. So I think we have a lot of uh, power with our economics. We have a lot of power with our vote. Mm -hmm. uh, we can I was lobby. Just say that. <laughs> yeah. Vote. Yeah, well, I would love for you. I, f I feel like, like I said last time, I'm like, I feel like I talk to both of you all day. Um, for those of you tuning in live, I, I don't, I don't see any questions in the. <laughs> it could be that I'm just missing it, um, but I don't see any questions. But I'll encourage you. Um, you're both part of the group. Perhaps um, I'll put it in there, You're, I'll tag you. And then if anyone tags the two of you, you might just check back in once in a while to answer a few questions. I think that would be great to keep the dialogue moving and going. And um, I'll also repost your, um, again, I love it. I printed it out. <laughs> your Our guidelines your... for studios to be anti-racist. Yeah, I think they're fantastic. They really are. I think everyone listening um, should take some time and, and look through this and and see what resonates with them and how how they can make some shifts and changes or suggestions, uh, whether they're a practitioner or even influential in their studio. It's pretty powerful stuff. Yeah, and I mean, if we're yogis or yoginis and we're going to say so hum, like the universe inside of me is the same as the universe outside of me, or we are all one or whatever those things, I am that, then with all this suffering and these murders and this violence, we can't stand around or sit around or meditate around. We really need to... If we're all one, then it's time to say if you, no more, no mm -hmm. more, no more voting for this person, no more supporting this yoga studio that only has images of white skinny women, no more supporting this yoga studio, all the classes are $25 or $30 a class, you know, no more uh, going somewhere where it doesn't have a racial diversity. You know, no more buying products, yoga mats or, or pants or halter tops from places that have racist politics. Mm -hmm. So it's time to educate ourselves and, and open our eyes and know that we are the change we wanna see. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And it starts in the body. So we're healers, right? We're yoga teachers, yoga therapists. We can make a tremendous impact on people's lives, on people's longevity, on the quality of people's lives, on the quality of our own lives. Like we have all the tools because like race-based trauma, it's trauma is in the body. You know, trauma we've learned is not in the prefrontal cortex. It's in the reptilian brain, it's in the limbs, it's in the body. 
So we as yoga teachers have special powers are specially equipped mm -hmm. to make a difference in, in, in with bodies in people's lives. I love that you that you really talk about that because I think because again we can do all the talking that we want to do but when it when it comes down to it it's so so much of it is in the body and it's somatic based and that's all the research is saying to make change it has to be in the body you can't think your way through something you know we, we we're doing um we're doing body so i'd love for you to do for us <laughs> <laughs> I'd love for you to give us um, an example. I know um, some, some simple practice that we can kind of take away from this today. Uh, for this particular, for the trauma, I, and I believe Naya also agrees that the best practice is acknowledgement. And for this, I'm just going to stand and we'll sit and be daughter of Patricia, who is daughter of Ruth, who is daughter of Margaret, who is daughter to many names that I have not been afforded to learn. And just take a moment of silence, maybe close your eyes and acknowledge their bodies, their being, their spirit, their breath that was in your own. you close your eyes, just blink them open gently. And if you had your gaze, let it go. Give yourself and all energies and bodies around us just a moment of reverence. Thank you so much. I see you, Z. I see you, Melissa. Melissa, I see you, Naya. <laughs> Um, I see you both. Um, it's really powerful. Thank you for honoring us with your time today. And I know we are all um, got a lot of plates in the air, but I truly feel this is a very valuable use of time. And I look forward to continuing to learn lots and lots from you both in the future. Um, We'll put in uh, all of your links as well. Um, I just want to encourage folks, you, you both do so much for many communities, um, whether it's uh, Alzheimer's and brain health or um, BIPOC communities, um, all people. <laughs> um, I know right now your class series are running, I think on Friday nights, is that right? So Friday evenings um uh us time zone uh and uh we'll put more information on those classes there so i think those would be super valuable for people to kind of dip their toe in the water and and another way to to really grow and learn i think um i i have learned a lot from getting out of my own sphere and making sure I'm taking from a really diverse set of teachers. There's so much to learn and to, to learn from, um, you know, uh, not only the wisdom of both of your experience in terms of years and, and just background is ridiculous, <laughs> but, but in terms of um, your depth of understanding of uh, really what we talked about today is really powerful. So thank you both. Thank you for the opportunity. I love it. <laughs> All right, we're gonna we're gonna close our live session. If anyone has questions, feel free to 
to type away and and tag and we'll we'll get to those so thanks everyone for joining us thank you so much.